We'll begin with a prayer. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Dear Heavenly Father, three and one, one and three. Help us to understand who you are and open our minds and our hearts to love you and to follow you and to serve you. Make us entirely yours. We ask this through the prayers and intercession of our mother as we say. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Now, last time we stopped halfway through this. Um, so we're going to continue on with this lesson. But we're going to just have a quick review over some of the concepts we covered. That's all, that's all sort of on the right page. Um, so we began by talking about one of the last verses um, of the Gospel of Matthew, where our Lord tells the apostles to go out and make disciples of all nations baptizing them in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And we show that, in fact, there is one name, but three persons mentioned. So you have very clear the mystery of the Trinity revealed um, right there. We talk about the fact that this is a very important thing. We're talking about who God is. We're talking about the fact that um, God himself is triumphant. We're looking at the inner life of God, and looking at, therefore, the most important mystery of the universe. Because everything comes from God and points back to him. And so and we're made his image and likeness. And so for, for even for very pragmatic reasons, for our own sake, um, it's good to know who God is, especially because ultimately you can't become his friend unless you actually know who he is. You can't become friends with someone you don't know. And so by learning about the Trinity, we learn we're able to more, become deeper friends with him. Um, we talked about the fact that human language is inadequate to, to describe the Trinity. And so we're using a word that comes from a Roman author in the 3rd century, Tertullian. Um, and talk about the fact that the Jewish culture of that time wouldn't have accepted or understood that idea of Trinity because of the fact that there had been such great effort to make us understand that God's one, so the one God. And because of that, the Lord is more gentle in revealing the, Trin the Trinity, even though it's a very clear, and we look carefully at it, he doesn't talk about it and give us a scientific or a textual definition, which we all like. Um, we talk about the fact that there can't be three different gods. Um, that if there's two different things, so something must make them different. Um, with a physical object, that, that something is their bodily parts. So with a pencil or a marker, it's the particular tube of ink, particular plastic, particular wood. Um, but because God is, doesn't have a body, he's, he's pure spirit, um, therefore, the only thing that can differentiate between different gods would be a degree in power and greatness. And any degree in power and greatness would mean that one of them isn't God. So therefore, you know, a very simple way of saying it, it is only one can be the best. And to be God means to be best, only be one God. Um, we talked about why the Trinity itself is a mystery, even though we can know that there's a God by reason. And that's simply because um, God works as one united, as a, has one God. The Trinity works as, as he has one nature. Um, and so while there are hints in the Old Testament and hints in nature, what we know in nature is that there's one God. We can't know his inner life. He's just hidden. You know, the, what he creates is outside of himself. Um, who he is is inside. And so we can know what's outside, that creative power that is one, is perfect. We can't know the inner life of the Trinity. As we look at some proof from the scriptures, the Father's God, that... Jesus Christ is God, the Holy Spirit's God. And yet they're all three different persons. We looked at times in the Scripture, New Testament, where you have all three mentioned, we distinct persons mentioned, the baptism, the Annunciation, the Transfiguration, and the St. Paul. And we talked about the fact that we have a church which helps us understand these things and keeps us from making any errors. 
And now we're ready to talk about the Trinity itself. So, any questions before we continue? Before we go on now with this next lesson? And talking about the Trinity. Can you just tell us where we are on your papers? Oh, uh, which one? Sorry. Oh, well, so we can follow you. Yeah, okay. sorry, which paper are you looking at? Okay, so we're on page, I should have, I should have made, maybe gave him numbers, shouldn't I? Yeah, just um, so it's the sixth page. Okay. The very bottom there, what is the Trinity? So in, in the outline, you can go in there and mark everything in. So in the outline, development of understanding over time, what is the Trinity? Sorry. Are you looking at the wrong? Yeah, I was trying to get the first week, I think. Oh, sorry. <laughs> okay. So at the very bottom of that page, you'll see what is the Trinity. There's three persons and one God. We're all on the same page. And if you do in the. Uh, And if you're in the other one, you have the picture of the guy studying, so believe he's teaching, I'm going to fall along the other one. And there's three little stick figures with an S and M and a B. <laughs> Very good question. <laughs> so we something would, we can do now. We can yeah. follow him. It's to make it more difficult for you, so you want to be able to follow me. <laughs> Part of my evil master plan is making things difficult for you. Making sure we are weak. That's right. So the Trinity is the doctrine that there is one God, and three persons. So the first thing we have to understand is, well, what's a person? Um, so there's a very technical definition, which I'm going to simplify. Um, and you can say it's a complete individual. A person is a complete individual that had a nature, or who has nature, I should call it better, who, rather than that or what, who has a nature, <laughs> meant for thinking, and loving. Nature simply is what a thing is and what it can do. So it's... Now we talk about a complete individual, because a person is not just part of something. So a person must be a complete individual thing. So my hand's a thing, my foot's a thing, it's not a complete thing, it's not a person. Um, nor my brain, not even my soul is a person. And so both my soul and my body are, are parts of who I am, they make up part of my personhood, but they're not me. So my soul is a part of me, but not me. And so even though um, the soul is the basis and the foundation for the personhood of the human being, the soul is not the same thing as the, per as the person. So complete. Complete in its nature, not part of it. And a nature that can think and can love. We can talk about as well when the other word is intellect. That part of us lets us think and free will. So it's a particular kind of nature. Um, we talk about thinking and loving. This can be confusing to people because animals have a kind of thinking and a kind of loving, but they're not what we're talking about. So an animal can't become friends with a human being. It can have an emotional attachment. You can't say it has a friendship in the same way. You can say, well, well the, my animal, but my dog recognizes me and wax his tail when he sees me. But you're not going to sit down with, with your dog and talk about your day. You're not going to uh, be able to have a real friendship with him. The same you're going to have another human being. So, okay, because the, the animal nature, um, okay, in terms of thinking, the animal um, has a brain and emotions. 
So everything that, that, that when it thinks, when everything in ter- it relates is with those brain and the emotions. We have a higher part of us called the soul. It lets us love in a whole new way. And so every, because an animal is, is completely physical, an animal can only know the physical. It can only know the singular things. So an animal has no concept of justice, has a concept of pain, a concept of I wanted that and it's not, not there anymore. You can't talk about justice or truth or beauty with an animal. You can't talk about things that, with, with a human being, you can talk about things that you're never going to see in real life. So you never are going to see justice walking around. You're never going to go outside and pick twos and threes. You can see two or three apples or two or three tables with chairs, but not just two and threes. So we can talk about those things and think about those things and know those things because we have a different, another part of us. That's the soul. And so when we love, we love in a whole different way. And so it's true the animal has an emotional attachment, which we also have. We also have an emotional attachment and affection and desire. And we also have a brain to think about things physically. But we have, in addition to that, a whole other way. And so friendship with a human being, you can never marry, marry a few dog. Because there's a friendship that can never exist between you and your dog. It can exist between a human being. Even if it's legal, it's not going to be legal. No, I was going to say, so far we can't. I don't, I don't, I don't, care, I don't care if it becomes legal, it's not marriage. You know, there's a whole, the relationship cannot be there. The relationship between a human being and your dog is different. It's a different nature. It's a, di- it's a different thing. Did that answer your question? Yes. Okay. And I'm not saying dogs don't love you or don't, don't have affection for you. It's a different kind of love than a human being has. And basically what it means is that open to a friendship and a love of God, especially. And a dog is not going to sit down and discuss the Trinity. A dog's not going to sit down and discuss who God is. A dog's not going to read the catechism. My to the catechism is not going to read it. <laughs> so there are actually three different groups that can be called persons. We have human persons, We have angelic persons, and we have divine persons. So this definition will describe every single one of those. But of course you have a different nature, a different kind of thing in each case. Angels are different than human beings, different than God. What makes us to be human persons is the fact that our soul but the human nature is body and soul. We have bodies. We're, we're both physical and spiritual. To be an angel is to have a nature that has no body, pure spirit. And God is a person, eternal, uncreated, perfect, infinite. Questions about this? So I have my special little stick figures. So here is Steve. Here is Mary. And here is Bob. Steve, Mary, and Bob are three human persons. They have three individual human natures. And they're three different human beings. Now we look at the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. The Trinity is three divine persons. One 
divine nature. and one divine being. Put it another way. God only has one divine will. The Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit do not have three divine wills. Only one will. The Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit have only one divine intellect. Only one mind. They're so united, there's only one God. One nature, all eternal, all knowing, all powerful, perfect, all good. Only one God. But there must be a real difference between that, and there is. And the difference between the three persons is their relationships between themselves. So the relationship is the difference. Now again, whenever we're describing this relationship, we're using human language and human analogies. Where is it going to land? And it's not going to be perfect. But it's going to be the best we, we can to describe the truth and reality we show you in the, in the New Testament. That the Father's God, the Son of God, the Holy Spirit's God. They're distinct, yet one. So how do we describe that? How do we understand that? especially because God himself gave us the analogy of father and son. So we're going to look at the individual divine persons. Remembering three divine persons, one divine being, one divine nature. So the father, God the father, is the source of the Trinity, the wellspring, the origin. But be careful. Because he's the origin, he is not first in time or majesty or power or goodness or anything like that other thing. If he's not first, he's the source. An analogy you can think about this is that Human fathers don't become fathers until there's a son there. Both the father and the son, in a certain sense, and even the human, human beings, begin to exist at the same time. Because there's no fatherhood until there's a son there to make him father. Or a daughter. Or a daughter. Mm -hmm. But with the analogy of the Trinity, so we use father and son. <laughs> <laughs> he always gets the one sword. <laughs> Shh, hands down. Right. Raise your hand, please. <laughs> So the Son is called in the Scripture, especially um, in the Gospel of John, but also other places as well, the Word. And there are several reasons for this, but the best way, one way, one reason, the reason we're talking about right now, is that it helps us to see an analogy between the way the human mind and the human words work. So, the analogy of our mind. We have an idea. I think about something. Maybe it's dinner. Maybe I'm thinking, when is Father Block going to be quiet? And so we have an idea. There is also, there is in my mind, an inner word, an inner idea that will match that. So remember, we, if I, before I can, I can speak any of these words to you, I have to have it first in my mind, inside, interior word. Some ideas aren't very personal, but some ideas are, so some words are. If I ever tell someone a deep secret about myself, express them who I am, it's very personal. It becomes an expression of who I am. In 
there are certain things, certain, you guys know someone very well, there are certain expressions that they use, certain ways that they use to express themselves. You can even see it in writing, oh, I don't know who that is. Just the way they express themselves. You know automatically who's spoken, who's written that, who said that. The problem with us, the problem is, is the long term word, the <laughs> fact of us is that we're limited. And so we think little pieces, little chunks, little bits at a time. And so no idea can ever be perfectly expressive of who I am. It can be partially, but not perfectly. But that's not true of God. God knows everything. And this includes, of course, himself. Now remember, God is the first. God um, is the creator. And ultimately, his thought, his idea, what he knows, is himself. Now, things he knows himself. Now, and thus, it's personal only to an extent, not so of God. In God, the idea, that inner word, is so personal, so perfect, so profound. It's not simply an idea, because it perfectly expresses who God is. It's another person. It's, it's God the Son. So that inner thinking, the inner word, he's expressing himself perfectly, eternal, all good, all perfect, all known. Knowing himself entirely, without lack or limit. An expression of himself is so perfect, so personal. It's a person. And that's God the Son. The Holy Spirit is similar with a twist. Because the Holy Spirit proceeds, as we say, and the creed proceeds from the from, what's the other creed? From the Father and the Son. So there's two now, not just one. Now we talked about human nature very briefly, very briefly. We said that um, there are two powers which makes us persons that we can think and that we can love. So God the Son is, remember, we're made in God's image. So the fact that we can think is similar to God the Son. So what would you think that God the Holy Spirit is analogous to? The act of love, the power of love, good. So the Holy Spirit... Is the sigh of love. Between the Father and the Son. And in fact, the Latin word spiritus as well as the Hebrew word ruach means breath, or sigh, or wind. So again, we have to look at the human will to examine this. So, we want something. Say, in this case, you want chocolate cookies. Mm. So, when we have this yearning in us, so we have in our wills, 
an image, a yearning, um, and will go toward that yearning. That's not just a, a yearning for that. It's not just like a yearning for something in general. It's going to be a particular thing. So our will has that a certain, you can call it an image in our wills, saying, this is what's going to satisfy me. You never look, open the fridge, look at the door, and you go, I don't know what I want right now. Of course not. <laughs> but sometimes it might happen to you. Okay, but there's something you're going to want. Say, so I really feel like egg is right. I feel like a toast right now. So we have in our wills, as well, something we're going to move toward, whether it's going to be cookies or a friend or God himself. So, the Father loves the Son. Remember, God knows who He is, and God sees the perfection of the Son perfectly. Sees how good He is, how great He is, and He loves His Son, one of the person. And the Son, in turn, sees the Father and loves the Father. Each recognize the goodness the other is and rejoice in that goodness. And this love, their love between them is so real, so personal, so expressive of who God is, that that love is another person, God the Holy Spirit. Their love is so personal it is it's really awkward to write down though, mm-hmm. as all of you know. <clears throat> and so the three persons of God are all truly God and are all truly persons. They're equal in power, equal in majesty. We can never say that one person is before or after another. We have to describe it in time. It took me 20 minutes to go through this analogy. <clears throat> But in reality, remember, God doesn't change. And so this knowledge and this sigh of love, this love for each other, is, is an eternal act. That's who God is, what God is. So right now, the Father knows the Son and is begetting the Son. Right now, the Father and the Son love each other <coughs> and spirate, breathe forth the Holy Spirit eternal act of knowledge and love. We can't say one is before, one's after. We can say about one being the origin, one being the sun. We can't say one's before, one's after, one's greater, one's less. The only difference between them is their relationships between each other. They don't share God, they're not parts of God, Each is completely God, each is perfectly God. But God is a being that's so different than us that to be God is to be triune. To be God is to be Trinity. To be God is to be Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So we talk about these, you know, we use the term procession. Now we use the word, we say the first person, the second person, the third person. These are sin, these aren't a description of time. It's simply it's a description of who God always was who God always is, and who God always will be. So to be God is to be Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. To be the Father is to be the one God. To be the Son is to be the one God. To be the Holy Spirit is to be the one God. I would like to uh, read, to have a little more time, um, the Eighth Nation Creed from the, this text here. So if you go to the second to the last page, you'll see a sheet that says the Eighth Nation Creed. St. Athanasius was a fourth century bishop. Um, 
who fought and taught about the, uh, the Aryan heresy. The Aryans were a particular group of people who, who taught that God the Son and God the Holy Spirit weren't really God. That God the Son was simply a lesser being, a created the highest angel, called the Aeons, that only God the Father was really God, and God the Son calls himself God, but it's just an analogy. That's what they that's the heresy they taught. And Athanasius fought against this, and this was a very this was a very the heresy was very far spread. It was it was very tempting for people to believe. It's easier for us to understand. Say, oh yeah, but there's there's three different gods, there's one God, and these other two two lesser gods. It's easier for us to understand. And so it was very tempting. It became a very big political mess because you had certain emperors and kings who wanted to be Christian, but didn't want to have to study the hard truths. And so they were willing to follow Arius, who was a priest, actually. And Athanasius fought against this heresy. Um, I was exiled, I think, six times. Um, kept coming back and be exiled again with the course of his life. Um, and so this is a creed which was probably not written by Athanasius, but it reflects his thought and his teaching. So we all, we all there? Okay. Whoever will be saved, before all things it is necessary that he hold the Catholic faith, which faith except everyone do keep whole and undefiled, without doubt he shall perish everlastingly. I put a little note, this means of course on purpose. You know, as I talked about in the first class, accident, not, you know, if it's an accident, it's, 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 the God's not, not going to punish us for that. We're only held accountable for what's our fault. And the Catholic faith is this. That we worship one God in Trinity and Trinity in Unity. Neither confounding the persons nor dividing the substance. Only one God. We don't mix up the persons like God the Father is God the Son. For there is one person of the Father another of the Son, and another of the Holy Ghost. But the Godhead of the Father, of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost is all one, the glory equal, the majesty co-eternal. Such the Father is, such is the Son, and such is the Holy Ghost. The Father uncreate, the Son uncreate, and the Holy Ghost uncreate. The Father incomprehensible, the Son incomprehensible, and the Holy Ghost incomprehensible. The Father eternal, the Son eternal, and the Holy Ghost eternal, and yet they are not three eternals, but one eternal. And also there are not three uncreated, nor three incomprehensibles, but one uncreated and one incomprehensible. So likewise the Father is almighty, the Son almighty, and the Holy Ghost almighty, and yet there are not three almighties, but one almighty. So the Father is God, and the Son is God, and the Holy Ghost is God. And yet they are not three gods, but one God. So likewise, the Father is Lord, the Son Lord, and the Holy Ghost Lord. And yet not three lords, but one Lord. For like as we are compelled by the Christian, Christian verity, the Christian truth, to acknowledge every person by himself to be God and Lord, so are we forbidden by the Catholic religion to say, there be three gods or three lords. The Father is made of none, neither created nor begotten. The Son is of the Father alone, not made nor created, but begotten, and where he comes, he's the word of the, of the Father. The Holy Ghost is of the Father and of the Son, neither made nor created nor begotten, but proceeding, breathed forth, spiraling. So there is one Father, not three fathers, one Son, not three sons, one Holy Ghost, not three Holy Ghosts. And in this Trinity, none is before or after another, none is greater or less than another, but the whole three persons are co-eternal, together and co-equal. So that in all things it is of course said, unity and trinity, and trinity and unity is to be worshipped. He therefore that will be saved must thus think of the trinity. So, a couple more things before we end. And that is, these are complicated ideas. And their ideas you think they're going to make your head hurt. Good. Makes me happy your head hurts. It means you're paying attention to your thinking. But we can be too involved simply with making it big ideas. And forget 
we're here to truly to know God, to love Him, and to, and to be work for Him. And so if all of these ideas are simply that ideas, and you're not working to deepen your relationship with God the Trinity, recognizing who He is, and loving Him more for His gifts to you, then you are wasting your time in this class. I mean, the more, it's not just about ideas, but this is about knowing our friend, knowing our God, being able to pass on to our children and to those whose parents have entrusted us who this God of ours is. And so this God of ours is great and different, complicated and beautiful and wonderful. And that's something we have to recognize and worship and acknowledge and rejoice in. And so these things that we're talking about, and I think it'll get easier the next, I think we've picked, I'll pass the hardest part of this, of this course, of this, these lessons. But whatever we talk about, oh, it's difficulty and complexity. If it's just a bunch of complicated ideas, it's not enough. This is about knowing God and loving God and understanding who He is. The other thing I want to point out to you is this very helpful, um, right before the Eighth Nation Creed, mm -hmm. the page back, is this little schemata, a bunch of different heresies. And this is very helpful because the, often the way the church explained to us who God is was by reacting and correcting heresies. Um, so by analogy, um, if I were to try to talk to tell you, what, well, okay, who, who is Barra? We know who Barra is. So I say, oh, well, she's Hispanic and she has black hair. And you were to say, oh, okay, well, I can see she's sitting in, in the second row wearing pink right now. I say, well, no, she's not. You're right, she's Hispanic, and she is wearing black hair, because curly, and she's wearing blue. So I have to kind of correct that. It's in the captain of God and the Trinity. So the church gave us these, these ideas and the scriptures. And first, we have people come along and say, oh, well, there's not really one God. No, there's only one God. Okay. So there are three gods. No, there's not three gods. There's only one God. Okay, well, Jesus is only pretend he's, he's God, but the God's okay is put on different masks. No, there's three different persons in God. Okay, well, only God the Son's really God, the Holy Spirit's not really God. So we cut it off from there. It's a very complicated, it took us 700 years, really. And so these are um, a very quick and easy way of, of remembering um, the difference between these, all these different isms. So atheism, no God, polytheism, many gods, pantheism, only one God and we're all God. That's a popular one today. And then some of the early heresies, Gnosticism, Manichaeanism, Arianism, Macedonianism. You should look at that on your own. Um, it's helpful to memorize these, helpful to look at these things. I would encourage you to, to know them. Questions? I'm going to do one last thing. I want to, as I said before, at the end of every one of these, to deliberately connect it to the four great truths of the faith. And again, that's the Trinity, the Incarnation, the Church, and who we are ourselves. The Trinity of Day, if you can skip, because that was the lesson. That's what we talked about the last two lessons. But the Incarnation. Remember, Jesus is the second person of the Trinity. So he came to teach us who God is by the incarnation, by his life, death, and resurrection, he taught us to know the Trinity, to bring us to the inner life of God. He let us see who we're meant to be, join us to God. 
And so if we have a mistake about the, about the Trinity, we're going to have a mistake about Jesus. We're going to truly grasp to see who Jesus is. We're going to understand the depth of his love, the depth of his coming to us, how important it is that he's come to us, become incarnate, and died for us. It's so only we understand the Trinity as best we can and hold that firm and truth and understand what he's done for us, what it means that God has walked among us, become a man, taught us to save us. The church is made by the Trinity. To bring us to heaven. The church is where we learn about who the Trinity is, where we get baptized, united with the Trinity. It's how we come to enjoy the life of the Trinity forever. Becoming, in a very real sense, we could even say an adopted member of the Trinity. And the church in and of herself is an analogy of the Trinity because she is one in many. One church, one body, yet many persons. Obviously very different in the Trinity, but a reflection of the Trinity. And so we can learn more about who God is learning about the church. And of course, human beings are made in God's image and likeness. And that means, in the image and likeness of the Trinity, So man is able to think and to love, and so reflects the Trinity in this one person, but also, because of that, is made to think about other people, to love other people, to help other people, to form relationships and families. So God in and of himself is family. We are different individual persons, different individual beings. God, one being, is a family in of himself. But us individual beings are meant to come together and form other families to reflect the Trinity. To be life-giving like the Trinity. To help others to know and to love and to join the life of the Trinity. And so we reflect the Trinity by the fact that we can think and we can love. We reflect the Trinity by the fact that we that can, from there, from relationships with other people, relationships of, of love and of service. And so we begin to see then how our faith is united, how it's one beautiful thing. And because, because we're small, we're going to be able to take a piece of the time. But we'll start here, and we'll end here, unless we have any questions. All right, let's close with a prayer. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit. As it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be world without end. Amen. The Lord be with you. May Almighty God bless you, the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Go in peace. Amen.